let's bring the music down this time. Hopefully we got the audio right. Look at that. A million two two hundred and twenty eight thousand views. Almost at fifteen hundred subscribers. Fifteen thousand subscribers. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to my studio. My name is Michael Markowski, and today we are going to recreate another painting by another one of my favorite artists of all time. Today we're going to be looking at the art of, drumroll, Berta Morisot. And Berta Morisot was one of the most important, most well-known, and respected Impressionist painters who also just so happened to be a woman. And she was a groundbreaking uh, figure, a, a, a proto-feminist figure before feminism was uh, even thought about. She broke so many ceilings for other women, and she's a, a, an incredible artist and um, a, an inspiring figure all around. So... This is the painting which we are going to recreate, not to be confused with another painting of flowers, of, of roses, that we did by Berta Morisot two and a half years ago. I'm not sure how long ago it was. It'll be under the very first painting series that we did. Um, and so we're going to do another uh, a painting of flowers of hers because I love the way that she does flowers. And I think it's a great example of impressionist technique. So I'm actually going to do two versions of today's painting. And I know people are like, oh my goodness, and not another two painting episodes. We'll be here all night. Hopefully not. Knock on wood. But uh, the way that she paints is, is quite quick. So you, you, we'll, I think we should have time to do two in, in our regularly scheduled allotment of time. Okay. Before we go any further, let's just sort of check in on the, the plan of attack today. So the plan is, is that we will begin by doing an image transfer, get the image onto the canvas. And in this case, it's this template. I'm going to show you how to find that momentarily. We're going to stain it. And I'm going to show you two different ways of doing this today. I don't usually do that, but I want to show because I think this painting warrants it. Then we'll talk briefly about uh, Berta Morisot's biography. And our underpainting, maybe we'll do one with an underpainting. I, I'll, I'll think about it. And then we'll, we'll sort of bounce around back and forth between the foreground and background. And in ideally about two hours from now, we'll do our side-by-side -side comparison. Okay, so maybe before we do that, just a quick reminder to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell so that you don't miss upcoming videos this Sunday, we're going to be doing a bonus episode where I look at all the artwork that you guys have created over the past, well, it's been a while since we've done one of those, so I'm excited to do that. Um, so you want to make sure you are you know when that's happening by hitting that notification bell as well as liking and subscribing this video. And I'm going to ask you to take a photograph of the painting you create today and upload it to our Facebook page. I'll show you that in a moment. Um... If you want to support the channel with a small donation, as little as a dollar, there's the PayPal link in the description below. You can use the Super Chat function here within YouTube if you see a little dollar sign next to where you can make a comment. Or you can contact me through the Facebook group or my website. Links in the description below. And thank you to all of those who support the channel regularly. I sincerely appreciate it. Again, like this microphone is a $200 microphone. If it wasn't for people like yourselves supporting the channel, my audio would still be miserable. And hopefully it's it's better. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about our first step here is the image transfer. So how do we get an image onto the canvas? So if uh, you click in the description below, you will see there's a Dropbox link in a Dropbox folder, which you can access... Um, through that link, you'll see the very top, these are our beginners episodes. And again, that's in the, there's a, a link to the playlist for all 250 or so episodes we've done so far. Uh, but these are the very introductory ones for, for people who've never touched acrylic paint ever before. And then you'll see this next set of, of lettered 
um, folders. These are all our basic paintings that I think anybody can do, even children, people who are just beginning. And our, and maybe I'll just let you know down, if we scroll down here, there's another, I think 160 folders that are numbered. These are maybe just a little bit more complex. So, um, but I still think even someone who's maybe just painted a little bit can do any of those episodes, especially if you understand the, the process that I use for painting, which is this split primary palette. Anyway, our folder is right up here, W. And there you see there's a bunch of different folders or files in here. There's the original uh, image. There is two versions of this outline that you can download and print, which I have done. And then there's also a, a little kind of a cheat sheet with some suggestions on, on uh, the steps that I'm going to use as well as colors. And we'll talk about that here in a moment. So once we get that image printed... It's going to look like this, right? It's just a piece of photocopy paper. I use, I use my inkjet printer here at home. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. And then I'm gonna take, this is a canvas board. You can buy these things at the dollar store. There is a link to this exact brand in the description below. And I think I, I buy like 24 of them at a time for $40. So it comes out to just under around $2 a canvas which is, you know, twice as much as the canvases at the dollar store, but I think they're much better. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to tape this down. And I usually tape it right in the middle. There's been a few instances where I move it a little bit to one side or another, but I don't think you can go wrong. Wherever you put it. Okay. I also have another one here, and I'm going to show you how I'm going to use that shortly here. But... For all intents and purposes, I'm going to use this carbon transfer paper. You can use graphite transfer paper. They do the exact same thing. And I'm just going to put this in. You'll see one side is shiny or darker, and one side's a little bit more ghosted. The shiny side you face down because that's the actual charcoal, right? So you want that. We're going to kind of basically push it off of the, the transfer paper onto the canvas itself. So this first one I'm going to do, I'm going to do most of the lines, maybe not a lot of the lines inside. I'm also not really worried about the lines being like, like capturing every little wobble of, uh, of these, the outlines, right? Um, that's not really important to me. Uh, and it's, as you'll see here, if we spend too much time on this outline, it's it's almost sort of um, misses the point of her specific way of painting because it's very loose. Some people will really, really like today's episode, will really like painting in this particular manner. On the other hand, some people might find this just a little bit too uh, free, quite frankly. And not that that's, you know, because the way that the Impressionist painters painted was they were creating impressions, right? Like as if a little quick glimpse out of the side of your eyes, you're, you know, walking through the grocery store and you, you th you're like, did I just see, I thought I recognized somebody from, from college that I, you know, 20 years ago, I, may, I must have been just must have not seen something properly, right? That's, I almost sort of think that's the way the Impressionist painted, is just glimpses of things. So there's these lines in the background. I'm not even going to bother that with that. But that's how my outline turns out. You know, there's maybe a, a line in there. That's pretty good. Uh, good enough. Good enough for government work, as my grandfather used to say. Okay. So I'm going to keep, I'm going to do one like this, and I'm going to do a second one here that's going to be much more simplified. And I'll just show you really quickly how I plan to do that. So let's just get this in here. 
And I'm only really going to do a few lines here because I... Uh, just so that the compositions are relatively similar. It's a little tricky when you're using the same color. I did get some blue pencils, but for whatever reason, I'm not using them. Okay, so you see that's how I did it. Maybe let's do one. Okay, so that one is it was done very very quickly. <laughs> Kathy says you have so many favorite paintings, Michael. I do. <laughs> that's funny. I appreciate that. Okay, so you can see here's one version where I've done a little bit more line work, and this one you saw me. I spent maybe ten seconds. I'll just sort of show these side by side on the screen here. All right, so that... Actually, you know what? I'm going to just put them side by side, because... Okay, so this is going to be the, the one that I'm going to paint in our traditional, uh, the way that, sorry, traditional in the sense, this is the, the one that I'm going to use our, the process that we've used consistently for a long time. This one here is going to be a little bit different, okay? So I'm just, I want to lay that out so that at some point, if I ever edit all of these together, I'll kind of have things aligned the way I like to have them done. Okay, so let's move. So our second step here is to stain the canvas with some color. And uh, the, that, the term that, that uh, is used to describe this process, this method, is called the imprematura. And it's an Italian term. It goes all the way back to the Renaissance and even before that. So 600 plus years artists have been doing this technique. And lots of artists have different ways of going about this. I'm going to show the first method here is kind of my own little um, version of it that is kind of um, a little bit different. And actually, you know, before I, I, I show you the color, maybe I'm just gonna tell you what paints I'm about to use here. So this is the brand of paint I use. I'm not sponsored, paid by, no one gave me free supplies. I buy it just like everybody else. Um, but I do like this kind. This is the kind when I'm teaching in person, I, 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 I give to my students. Um, you obviously have seen me use it consistently for 250 plus episodes. I just think it works really well. It's pretty good cost to quality ratio. I think it's pretty high. So, and uh, but if you don't have this brand or you want to try something else, here's Golden. This is probably one of the more expensive acrylic paint brands, a professional grade paint. So the names are slightly different, but the paints are going to be pretty similar. Liquitex. They make a professional and a student grade. This is their student grade paint. Uh, Windsor and Newton. Artist Loft uh, Art Supplies, from, from Michael's Art Supplies, sorry. Um, the Buzz, Peebo, Holbein, Dyler, Rowney, and I've added a few more here. The Fevacryl, so this is a brand um, that I, apparently is very common in India, and I know a bunch of my friends from India have been asking me about this, so this is my recommendations. I, again, I haven't used this in person, but I, I'm pretty sure that should work. Uh, Nova Color, this is a brand down in Los Angeles. I used to paint with Nova, Curl Nova Color when I was living in Los Angeles. Chroma Color, this is a Vancouver uh, brand that uh, is manufactured right here in Vancouver. And these are the colors I would choose. And this is another one that I have bought and tried to use in my in-person classes here in Vancouver. 
and found it to not work. Oops. So, that's why I'm showing you here because the weird thing with this brand is the paint looks great on its own, but there's white that's been mixed in, I think probably to um, make the colors a little bit more opaque to make up for cheap pigments. And when you mix those colors, you're, it's impossible to get a black because all of the colors have a little bit of white into it. So when you, you mix the, the black as we do, the color goes gray. So that might be, as I think about that, that might be something that might be a problem for more than, than just this brand. So if you're noticing that you're always getting gray, I would love to hear from you about which brand of paint it is that you're using. Okay, so I'm going to get out my paint here and I'm going to put some warm yellow onto my palette here to make uh, my imprimatura. So I'm going to take a little bit of water and stir it up. This is really the only time where you really want to put water in your acrylic. If you can, help it, right? I obviously know not everyone has access to to glazing fluid or, or matte medium or, or gloss medium, even though they're only a few dollars uh, extra. But if you really want to sort of take your painting to the next game, you really want to try to avoid using water whenever possible you know like what would be the 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 analogy in food because you know I like using my food it's like um, you know it's like using water instead of milk and eggs if you're baking, I suppose, right? Like, can you bake a bake bread without any uh, milk or eggs? Sure, absolutely. Um, is it maybe going to get the results that you expect to get if you don't use milk and eggs? Not really. Although I have used... Um, cooked with just water a number of times, because we, we've all been there where... You, uh, you, you, you get into, you're like, I'm going to bake some, something right now. And then you start mixing and you're like, oh, I, I really don't have <laughs> any the required supplies. Okay. So that's our first step. This is how I normally do it. And so I'm going to leave this like that to dry. And I am going to put this here. Okay. So now I'm going to show a slightly different method here. And this is a method that I, I've, I have talked about. I think I've shown this maybe a couple of times before. But instead of just using this yellow, um, you can put just a little bit more in there. Uh, and in fact, while I'm doing this, I'm just going to start putting paint onto my palette. So you'll you see here I'm I'm putting I've got my warm yellow, my warm blue, my cool blue, my cool yellow. I'm never sure how much I'm gonna need for each of these colors. So I usually tell people, put as much paint on your palette as toothpaste on your toothbrush. To which inevitably some people are like, wow, how many teeth do you have, Michael? That's a, either a lot of paint or <laughs> or toothpaste, or barely any. Um, and then I'll just put some white in here. One of the things that Berta Morisot often did is used a lot of white in her painting. This painting not really is not the best example of that, but 
that is a technique that um, her and other impressionists are kind of well known for doing is using a lot of white. So what I'm doing here is I'm gonna mix a warm brown. So what I've got is my warm yellow, which I applied previously, right? I've got my warm red and my warm blue, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mix this into a brown. Put a little bit of water in here. So as a reminder, if, if, if you haven't seen any of my previous episodes, my introductory episodes, to make a brown, what we want to do is we want to mix an orange. So we're taking our warm yellow and our warm red, and that's going to give us an orange. And then we're going to mix across the color wheel. Because what that's going to do is if we add a color from over here, in this case the warm blue, it's going to pull this orange towards the neutral core. If we add enough blue in here, we can turn this color into a black or into a gray by adding white to that black, right? So we're not going to add too much because we want it to kind of exist a little bit around here, right? So that we can get, you know, depending on how much blue, if we put a little tiny bit of blue, we'll get that. The more blue we put, we'll get this brown. The more blue we get, we'll get black, right? So I just think it's helpful just to do a quick little review. So I'm gonna take some red. Let's mix this in here. Let's create an orange. That's very red. I added maybe a little bit much. Not sure how well that comes across on camera. Let's take some blue and just add that to that. Whoa, that's a be more blue than I was expecting. Well, it's it, sometimes it looks darker until you have blended into the rest of the paint. So that's pretty good. In fact, what I'm gonna do is I'm also just gonna put a little scoop of this to the side here. I'm gonna make another one. It's gonna be a little bit darker. Now that's basically like a greenish brown because there's a lot more blue in here so i'm going to add more red back into this maybe i'll just try mixing right into the red put some of this back into here this is why i love painting is because it's just it's like playing with mud you know i spent Part of this morning here with our daughter at the park and she just loves getting messy <laughs> and getting her hands into the mud and getting it on her face and that is just makes I just it makes me so excited to see that okay so what I'm gonna do um, for this method to to paint like Berta Morisot and the other impressionists is is sort of just I want to sort of show you a little bit about um, the impressionist philosophy and approach to um, the, the starting a painting. So it's possible um, Berta Morisot uh, did spend a, a, a kind of a, a decade of her life really refining her her use of charcoal and Conte. In fact, you know what? Let's, let's might as well just go all out on this, right? Since I'm here, I'll show you that. So what she probably would have done is, is she wouldn't have used the graphite transfer paper. I don't think it would have existed that, at least not in that pre-made form that we're using here. So inside this box of what we call willow charcoal, and this box, I think I bought for like five or six dollars at a local art supply, and it's not that expensive. Charcoal is literally one of the oldest art supplies on earth. One of the first materials that cave people were using millions of years ago. And you can see inside this particular package, we've got lots of different sizes. We've got some of these shorter sticks, we've got some bigger sticks, and we got, 
you know, lots of different variety. Obviously, you can buy a package that just has one consistent size. You can get, you know, two or three of these in a package, 10 of these, or 30 of these, right? I love using this, and I would suspect that she probably, on this painting, might have used this stick, and she's drawing directly from life. So she's probably going over, as I will just hear, some of these lines. In fact, let me bring the original up, and I'll just sort of sketch side by side with the original just to show you what I suspect she would have done. Right, so she probably would have just taken this material, sketched it in. She may even have gone in here and just sort of darkened a little bit. Been like, okay, this is where I want my darker areas to be. All right, and might have been like, okay, this area I'm just gonna it's gonna be, you know, because one of the things with these willow charcoal is it's we can draw with the point and make sharp lines. Right, but I can also snap it if I want. It's very easy to snap. And I can draw holding the side here. Like. Right, using the side of the charcoal. And then I can just take my finger and blend that. Right? So that gives you a pretty good idea of how she would have probably sketched that initial phase of the painting. It's also possible that what she would have done is instead of doing this with charcoal, is she might have gone directly to this type of like a rusty brown, rusty red color and sketched with her paintbrush this way. So let's bring up the original just so we can kind of see. And again, she probably would be holding the paintbrush quite far away like that, and just sort of quickly sketching in here. All right, sketching this out. Just getting things kind of in the vicinity. With combined with the the graphite or charcoal, or it would have been charcoal, or Conte perhaps she might have used. And so she would probably kind of do this. And this is also, you know, often what we might consider to be the underpainting, right? So she might do this w directly onto a white canvas, because the Impressionists were some of the first artists to not use the traditional imprimatur process. Some of them, not all of them, but that was something they experimented with. Because if you think about, like, the Impressionists were revolutionary in, in so many different ways. And one of the things, you know, that if you're trying to do things differently than everyone has done in the past, then then you start at the, the very beginning. You're like, imprimatura, huh? Yeah, I know our teachers and their teachers and their teachers and their teachers um, have been using the imprimatura, but we're going to do something a little bit different. Uh, TX Olive says, wait, are you live? Yes, I am live. <laughs> yes, thanks for joining us. So, um, that's sort of how she might have begun this painting. Now, she probably would also, she might have done something like taken another yellow, or, or this brown, maybe kind of mixed a little bit of both, and kind of quickly filled in some of this area. Maybe not all of it. Like if we go back to the original here. All right, if I take a little bit more of this. So she might have left some white. I think I'm just going to paint it all in. Like 
to that. And you can see it's also kind of, we want to have this almost sloppy-like approach. That's kind of part of it, right? That it's not this perfect um, uh, what would you say? Like, um, you're not, the, the goal is not to be perfect with impressionism. The goal is to kind of, is to be painting as quickly as possible before the light changes, before um, somebody moves, if you're painting a person. Um, sometimes, like, they're painting people who are sitting at coffee shops and pe people that are dancing, and you don't have time to. They're not going to sit still for you. You got to keep on moving. So maybe let's take one of these darker browns. I'm just going to put this down here. And it's kind of also mixing with my Conte or my graphite or whatever you might choose to use down here. It's, well, in my case, the, my charcoal. Um, so that can you can also paint with a little bit of a lighter color. And just by mick painting on top of that charcoal, which is a little bit loose, it's going to naturally darken that paint. So it's all kind of mixing together. So that might be how that first start part started. I'm just going to wipe off this brush. And then I might go back to my yellow here. And just kind of quickly paint it. Now again, I'm, I am also taking a few liberties with with her approach. It's probably, she, she might not have painted the, the whole surface quite as thoroughly as I'm doing. She might have left a number of little white areas, and maybe I could have done that here. So I'm not sure how that looks on camera. It probably just looks like a lot of red and brown. And it does. It does look like a lot of red and brown. Um, but already what she's doing is starting to kind of define the, the, the different areas of the painting. Foreground versus background. This countertop is kind of both foreground and maybe middle ground as well. So she's starting to kind of even at this early stage in the painting, to give it some structure. So we can see, you know, the difference between this painting and the one that, you know, I have been doing this, my, my approach that I've done for many paintings so far. So this one you can see is, is pretty, carefully done. This one is already kind of, it looks a little bit messy, which is a lot like how the Impressionists painted. Um, which, of course, is why so many people um, were outraged by the art of the Impressionists, because they, for them, it's just like, are you kidding me? You're not allowed to make a painting like that. It's got, it should be, be done much more carefully, like a craftsperson making jewelry or sewing a fine carpet or quilt. Not like this, you know, like a uh, this big messy kind of style of painting. Anyway, uh, let's, yeah, let's move to our next step here. Where is it? Okay. So what I want to do now is I want to talk a little bit about the biography of Berta Morisot, who she was, where she came from, and how she became such an important artist, and why she became this really important feminist icon, or proto-feminist icon, I guess you might say. So, um, just while I'm here, just as a reminder to... Uh, join our Facebook page. How many we are at? How many members? 497. So just a few um, f away from 500 members of our Facebook group, which grew from nothing. It was just a suggestion in the chat. Like those of you who are watching right now, that's so awesome. So just remember to take a photograph of your work and join the Facebook group. And upload it there because this Saturday I'm going to be looking at all the great work you've done and giving you feedback. No painting, just celebrating. Speaking of 
of celebrating. It's time for a quick sip of tea. <sighs> okay. So, Berta Morisot, born in 1841 and dies in 1895, unexpectedly at age 54. So, um, I think, you know, if she had lived another 20, 30 years, like some of her peers, like uh, Claude Monet particularly, I think she'd be way more well-known and respected than she is. In fact, probably the saddest thing that I can imagine is when she died, the, I don't know, the medical examiner or, you know, when they issued the, the death certificate, on her death certificate it was written that she had, uh, what do they call it, no particular... Uh, uh, career or no particular job or, or you know, I, I can't remember the, the French word métier. He was like, so it was uh, basically they just described her as just sort of just being just an ordinary woman, right? And hadn't hadn't achieved or done anything with her life as most women had done at the time. And I'm again, I'm just just sort of playing a caricature because of the attitudes of the time. She created over 800 paintings during the course of her life, and yet when she died, there was just like, ah, she, she didn't do anything. Why, why? She's just a normal normal woman, right? And women aren't really that important, so throw her in the, in the grave and be done with it. To her peers, however, like Claude Monet, Edouard Manet, Manet, Monet, two different artists, Edgar Degas, Camille Pissarro, and so on and so forth, she was, they, they thought of her as probably the, the, the best colorists of the Impressionist group. So we'll get into that here in a moment. So she's born um, to a fairly wealthy family. Her father was in, like the prefect of uh, the, the, of an area called Cher, which I'd never, I didn't realize Cher had her own, um, uh, area in France. Um, anyway, uh, the uh, so so she you know being an administrator in uh, fairly high up in the uh, you know civil servant in France would have paid very well, and she's also a, the direct descendant or the the great niece of a very famous French artist named Fragonard. Um, so I have. Yeah, Jean Honoré Fragonard, and Fragonard it was he's one of the most famous French artists of all time. He was particularly he was very famous as a Rococo painter, and the Rococo was the period that coincided ultimately with the French Revolution. So people like the King Louis the Sixteenth of France and Marie Antoinette and and those types of, of uh, figures were big fans of his painting because his paintings really kind of uh, celebrated the, the lives of the wealthy in France. Whether you think that's a good thing or not, um, that's what he did. He was, that's, you know, the, that was the client base that he was making art for. Um, this is probably his most famous painting. This is a painting I do want to do at one point, The Swing. Um, uh, it's just a pretty complex painting. So this would be one of those like five, six hour paintings. So there's a lot of detail in here, but this gives you an idea. It's like these people, f rich, wealthy people in gorgeous satin clothes, frolicking in the beautiful opulent gardens of Versailles, etc. Right. So I, I, I just mentioned that because I do th think that th having this, really excellent pedigree of being a descendant of really one of France's most popular artists. And even though, you know, he sort of fell out of favor uh, with Napoleon and the and the subsequent artists post-French uh, Revolution period, he still, you know, people still had some affection for him, especially people within the academia of French art. Um... So I think that did help open doors for her that were probably otherwise closed for most other women who also aspired to be artists. And, um, you know, in France, as well as in 
North America, Canada, United States, Great Britain, um, Germany, etc. It was quite common for uh, women, particularly kind of in the bourgeois upper classes, to uh, undergo training in arts and crafts, right? You know, as they they would learn how to how to paint, do watercolors, and sew and knit and crochet and you know little needlepoint and um, things to sort of keep them busy while they're raising the children, right? We don't want them getting doing anything too intellectual because they might get some ideas and whoa, what would happen if women got ideas, right? So they sort of perceived painting to be um it's 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 really interesting these sort of contradictions it's like painting both being sort of one of the great things that a human could aspire to in french society and simultaneously also something for housewives right um i'm not really sure how, the, how that's reconciled but uh anyway that um was the thought at the time and so she took being sort of a, of a wealthy family, she took art classes from some of the, the great artists of the time. And one of the big things that artists did at that time was to go to the Musée uh, du Louvre, and uh, which is, you know, that the where the Mona Lisa is today. And artists, both men and women, would go there and often set up an easel right next to a painting and make copies of the original. Sounds kind of familiar to making studies of master artists. I wonder where, who would have done something similar to that? Like a master study. Anyway, while I think of, of that, that's what she was doing, and that's what really every artist up until maybe the 1960s used to do all the time. And really the Louvre was sort of a semi public private place it's not like it is today where you know there's zoos of tourists going through there it was more for the the wealthy upper classes to both look at art and sort of like a like a really really expensive shopping mall that really didn't sell anything but you could go there and you'd put on your fancy dress and top hat and like you're probably not a dress and a top hat someone would put a dress on and someone would put on a coat and top hat a top hat and a dress would be would make quite the stir and, and lots of uh, tittering um, would go on. Anyway, uh, so she would go there and she would make these paintings of the Louvre. Um, and it uh, that was still, like, doing that is starting to really push the boundaries of what was accepted for women and at that particular time. And it probably, even, so... Even though she would have been able to do that, she probably would have had to have been chaperoned by, you know, maybe someone in, maybe a maid or something from her household. Maybe it was a man, maybe it was a chauffeur of some kind who took her by horse carriage out there. Um, and even then, there would only be certain paintings that she would have been allowed to paint, right? It just seems crazy to me, but women, even those women who were being given art history classes and painting classes were really limited to painting like flowers other women children and landscapes those would be but you were not allowed to paint um historical painting or or illustrate scenes from the bible because those two things are at the very very top of the hierarchy of of art so at the very top to, to be a quote-unquote great artist, you had to be a man, first of all, obviously, right? And you had, and you would aspire to paint, you know, scenes of kings being coronated or uh, major battles in European history or Jesus being crucified or being taken down from the cross or, or various other um, biblical scenes. So she wouldn't even be allowed to to paint those paintings, even though she's only making copies for her own self. But anyway, um, she would also, she, both of her older sisters were also aspiring artists, but they got married off at younger ages and went off and moved to different cities and she would kept writing letters to them. But uh, that was kind of quite sad for her because those were her kind of her closest 
uh, painting uh, buddies and um, but during that period where she's now sort of painting by herself in the Louvre again it starts to become you know people are probably talking they're like oh why is she doesn't have her sisters here anymore why is she here by herself like that is that's pretty weird and some of the other young artists of her same um, uh, period her peers like Edgar Degas Claude Monet, Edouard Manet, Camille Passaro, all of these names that later become very famous as the Impressionist um, movement, sort of see her there and are like, wow, this, this woman is like pretty dedicated. She's here like every day making paintings, even though she gets all these angry looks from all these stuck up old men and um, good on her, like she's she's doing it that's pretty cool it's i'd really admire that right so i'm sure they start and she's like and she's not doing a bad job she's doing pretty good but one of the things that uh you know she one of the the artists that she meets there is this artist uh jean baptiste camille Corot, and Corot is um really one of the the most important landscape painters of all time and Corot. Let's just open up a tab for Corot. He is really instrumental in, in helping to popularize landscape painting as a serious activity in and of itself. Not because prior to artists like Corot, and I mean, we could go back, there's a, a, a number of other ones um, even prior to him, but really landscape painting was seen as sort of like, not an end of itself, but backgrounds for history paintings or biblical scenes as i mentioned before right so the idea of sort of taking all the people out and not illustrating a great battle but just a forest or a seascape on its own was sort of kind of a little bit of a radical thing so he's a little bit of a the previous generation uh, and he kind of takes her under his wing and, and teaches her sort of what he knows but he's also an early um, uh, promoter of going outside and painting directly from the in from the landscape in the landscape, or what becomes known as plein air painting, and that is one of the major revolutions that the impressionists are are really known for. Even though, again, there were people who were painting outside prior to this. But uh, um, so she starts going outside and starts painting. In fact, she is the one who encourages Edouard Manet to also go outside and paint with her and Claude Monet. And that becomes, uh, you know, Manet arguably becomes one of the most famous Impressionists. Um, and then sort of the others kind of follow along after him. So, so it's, it's it's that's really important. The fact that she is the one that spurs Manet to go outside is that's. I mean, I don't know. Art history would be very different if Manet had never gone outside, right? Um, and it just shows the, her influence on other artists that are considered to be titans, the most famous artists of all time. Uh, I'm going to skip through here. I know I've been talking for a while here. Oh, I need to get, get painting here. Um, oh, there's a great quote in here. I love this quote. This is really worth just thinking about and just thinking about how far we've come. We're not, we're not where we want to be just yet in the world, but I think we're getting closer. So the quote is, I don't think there has ever been a man who treated a woman as an equal, and that's all I would have asked for, for I know I'm worth as much as they. I don't think there's ever been a man who treated a woman as an equal, and that's all I would have asked for, for I know I'm worth as much as they. Couldn't have said it better myself, right? And as we sort of just look at some of her work, it is sort of stunning that these sort of uh, very um, uh, ancient, one would like to think ancient beliefs, you know, which still in some areas persist, but 
it's funny, like she would make a painting, you know, side by side to Manet and people would say, oh, it's such a feminine, there's so much feminine charm in your painting, even though they're almost indistinguishable. In fact, you probably could have swapped them and they still would have said of Manet's painting, oh, just so delicate, such delicate womanly touches on the canvas. She's probably just rolling her eyes like, are you kidding me? I think there'd be a great movie about her biography. I think, you know, if, if you know, someone wanted to uh, do a, a real, a really powerful biography, it would be very timely today, would be to do a, uh, a film about her. Um, so we've talked about, I don't want to, I'm starting to run on time, so I just want to kind of quickly cover this. How, um, so the Impressionists, were essentially, there was the academy and the salon, the salon, the, which is where every artist, if you wanted to be an artist in France or really in Europe, every country had their salons or the academy, you'd submit your painting to it. Most people would get rejected. You might get one or two paintings in for the spring or fall salon. And she was exhibiting in like 1864, I think might've been her first um, painting that was accepted into the salon. Uh, is there any information about that in here? Yeah, at age 23, 1864, she had two paintings accepted into the salon. Like, pfft, that is, that's really remarkable, right? That is, that's pretty, that's incredible. So, and that's five years before today's painting. I think this is 1869-ish, I'm pretty sure. Um, so... You know she's all but she's painting in a much more academic way and so so are the other impressionist painters but the impressionists start getting rejected more as they kind of evolve more into the style that becomes known as impressionism they get rejected more and more and more until people like manet um and uh, uh claude monet and who is the other artist oh um just escapes me but anyway there's a number of them get are constantly rejected by by the salon so they're just like screw this why are we trying to get acceptance from these people whose paintings we don't really respect we just think they're a bunch of old you know uh stick in the muds let's just form our own salon and we can show our own paintings we don't have to even worry about getting through these gatekeepers which is what they do and there's eight impressionist exhibitions that are held each year over the next um, decade. And she participates in every single one of them, except one of the final ones. And the only reason she didn't exhibit in that, uh, the all eight of them is during that one year, she gave birth to her daughter, Julie, who herself, Julie becomes quite, she's painted by a lot of uh, artists in Paris that later on. Do I have a tab of Julie Manet? So, you know, um, a beautiful young woman who becomes a, an important kind of writer and curator, collector of art herself. Um, but, um, yeah, the other Impressionist painters certainly respected her. You know, it's, in, you know, I, I was thinking today, like, it, that is also probably one of the reasons why you know the impressionists would have been ridiculed and uh, by the kind of wider academic and maybe in society in general is they're just like oh my god those impressionist painters they are so bad they're so get this they let a woman exhibit with them that's how crazy and awful these painters are like what kind of respectable like artist society group lets women put their paintings on the wall right next to them that's pfft, that i'm certainly not going to take that group seriously well the impressionists have the last laugh as we as we know okay so um i think just want to mention so she dies again unexpectedly um Oh, maybe I should also mention, so before I get to her unfortunate passing, uh, as I said, she, she painted alongside Edouard Manet, and Manet respected her as a, one of his peers, so much so that he introduces um, Berta Morisot to his brother, um, uh, uh, Eugene Manet, 
and they're subsequently married and they have a child julie of course so um they and they live happily until um um Berta Mauricio dies in 1895, 20 years later um, of pneumonia. Her daughter was actually suffering from the same thing at the same time. Um, so she dies really young. I mean, 54 for an artist is, is really young because a lot of artists, particularly, you know, things have changed now where you have artists in their 20s and 30s who become very successful. And um, But that is that really didn't happen except for a few isolated incidences like Picasso, who was very successful in his teens. But for the most part, most artists actually had other jobs, you know, were doctors and lawyers. And then after they retired in their 50s and 60s is when they devote themselves full time to making art. And so the fact that she dies at age 54 is really when her peers are just getting started. Like we talked about Claude Monet. We did his water lily painting just the other day. And you know, this is a painting that Claude Monet did, you know, in what, this is 1915 and he dies in 24, I think. And he died at like age 90, right? He's a, basically the same, you know, born around the exact same time as Berta Morisot. So, you know, he lived an extra 40 years beyond her and achieved really his most successful paintings you know, during that latter half of his life. So, uh, yeah, let's, I'm, I've just been talking. I, I, I was going to talk for like five minutes about this stuff, but I just love thinking about, uh, about these artist biographies because it makes it so much more interesting for me to kind of really step into someone's um, shoes here. Okay, so we've been talking about biography underpainting do we want to do an underpainting maybe I'm gonna do a little bit of underpainting for this uh, this painting here so and I think I'll do it a little bit on both so um, let's 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 go back to this one even so I'm going to kind of go a little bit backwards. And, you know, I've cut well, some of the, the paint that I've applied on there is kind of gone. is kind of blurred out a little bit. So what I think she probably would have done just to get a little bit closer to what she would have seen at some point in her on her easel as she's painting, maybe something like this. But again, maybe just a little bit more outlining quickly and maybe trying to just define a little bit more of these darker areas so I'm just using these darker colors here Just a little bit more of that. As far as this other painting is concerned, maybe I'll just do a little bit of that here as well, just so you can kind of see how that might work on a painting like this if you've done that. Is maybe just a little bit of outlining, particularly the darker areas of this painting. So again, we have to remember this is probably being painted, I'm sure it's being painted directly from life. So she's got this still life set up in her, on her kitchen counter or table, and then kind of quickly applying paint like this to it. So 
down here, I'll probably mix a new brown down there in a moment, but we'll get there shortly. Um, so, our first step now will be to, or not our, our, our next step here is going to, we're going to paint the background on both of these paintings. And I think it's going to be interesting for us to see how these, how the colors, because what I'm going to do is basically paint the same color on both of these backgrounds. So we have one that's got this kind of bright, warm yellow right out of the tube. And this one that's got this kind of rusty brown. Uh, and we'll see just, you know, quite clearly how much this imprimatura and using a different imprimatura will ultimately affect the overall painting. Right, so let's maybe let's start with this one here. Let's clean my brush. Okay, so now I'm going to get my palette out with all my paint on it here. My warm, my two yellows, my two reds and my two blues, right? And we call this the split primary palette because we've split our quote unquote primary colors into two, a warm yellow and a cool yellow, a cool blue and a warm blue, a cool red and a warm red, right? Every color is either warm or cool, but some are, are really hot and some are really cold and some are just so lukewarm that it's like barely on like so for instance you know we, this is our an ultramarine blue and this is a cerulean blue cobalt blue is very close to the middle in between them to the point where telling the difference between it being warm or cool is pretty tricky and we can make that color by just mixing those two together that's why why would you go buy that color when you can mix it yourself you know, if, you're, you, if you really like that color and you want to use it a lot, well, of course that makes more sense. But um, if you're just painting that we're doing, you, you can certainly get away without it. So, um, let's bring our image back. Oh, I should also maybe just mention... So, uh, this is included here in the Dropbox folder. You'll see this kind of little cheat sheet for information on how to um, uh, mix some of the colors, my suggestions. So, you know, one of the things I'm suggesting here for our background, our first pass on the background, is to mix your own black and then to kind of give it a bit of a grayish quality, maybe a little bit into a bit of a green. Um, so that's why we can see that there's a little bit more blue and yellow in here as well. So, um, let's let's follow my own instructions here. So I'm able to just move this off to the side here. Which brush should I use? Let's go for here's a brush that's you know it's it's starting to fray a little bit. It's been been well used, but when we're painting in this kind of style, I think like a brush like that works really well. So so first we're going to mix a black, and to mix a black. What we want to do, just as a quick review for people, is we want to we want to take three colors that are you know it, about as far apart as possible, or at least one of them should be as far away as the other two. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to take our cool yellow and mix it with our cool blue, and that's going to give us a green. And right across the neutral core from green is red. In this case, I'm going to use my warm red mostly because it's a little bit more opaque than my cool red. Um, if I mix my cool red in here, I'm more likely to get, because it's a little bit closer to my blue, a little bit more of a brown. So I want a little bit more of a black. So I'm gonna use my warm red, right? Because it's, it's, it's also the opposite temperature as my two cool colors. So it's gonna help facilitate that color. Tea break. Okay, so let's start with our green. I'm gonna take a big lump of 
E, where should we do this? Let me, let's mix this right here. Take a bunch of yellow. I'm going to take a little bit less blue, or we'll, we'll see here. What did I say? Actually, I said a little bit more blue, so that's actually, let's take a little bit more blue. I said 15% uh, cool blue, 10% cool. Well, actually, sorry, maybe what I should do is let's mix this first. I'm going to mix my black as I normally do. Okay, I'm going to take my warm red now and mix this into here. And of course, this, this color is going to sort of change as I mix it. So it might start really or orangey or green. And then as you sort of get all these colors in, it, the color should start dying. It should start kind of just disappearing. Right? Where it's like all those colors are canceling each other out in this mixture. And that's pretty close to... A mixture that I think we want that's I mean that's basically a black there you know it, it although you know it's very hard to dis to, to discern what color do I actually have here is that in fact black or is it a purple or is it a brown is it a green I don't know right so to find out let's take some white and I'm gonna mix this on the side here what the white does is it reveals what this color actually is. And I put that white in there and I'm gonna give myself a little pat on the back. I mean, that's about as perfect of a gray as you can get. So that tells me that's about as perfect as a black I can get. Sometimes if you put a little bit of white into this, you'll notice, oh, that looks kind of purpley. Well, what does that tell us? If it looks kind of purpley, it tells us we've probably got a little bit more red and blue in there we need to add a little bit more yellow if it looks a little bit green we probably got enough yellow and blue we need to add a little bit more red in there if it looks a little bit orangey or brown that probably tells us we've got enough red and yellow we need to add a little bit more blue but anyway that's this, this is we've got a nice black now and again I probably make it look a little bit easy I hear from people all the time like oh, I can't can't get my black like that what is going on so again that could be the paint you're using and if you cannot get a black at all you, you've tried hours and hours and you just keep getting grays that's probably because the paint you're using ha is fortified with titanium white to kind of disguise the fact that the pigments a little bit cheaper um, possibly there could be a few other reasons I won't go down but um, if that's constantly happening, please let me know so that I can not recommend that paint to future people in future episodes. Because I, I, I think I've heard that before, but I, uh, anyway. So let's look at our, our menu here, what I'm recommending. So we made our black, and then I'm just saying to add a little bit more white um, and put in some, a little bit more blue and yellow to get this color in the background and I think you know if we zoom in a little bit you can see how it's got this little bit of a bluish quality in here but it's not everywhere because another thing that the impressionists do is they don't want a nice solid color everywhere in the painting you know we did this Marilyn Monroe painting what um, uh, two weeks ago and part of painting like Andy Warhol is we want a solid color without any variety of variations in it, or at least if you're trying to get towards that approach to painting. So with Warhol, we want a consistent color. When it comes to the Impressionists, we don't. We want it to look like there's every little area, every time you dip your brush back into the paint, you're picking up a different color. Like we've got a little bit of a different background color here than we do up here so I, I just say that so that if you're painting you're like ah it's just looking too it looks too green here it's a little patchy and I sometimes see people repainting the backgrounds over and over and over that's okay don't make it doesn't have to be perfect in fact the less perfect it is I think the better at least in when we're approaching a painting in this particular style <laughs> 
So let's kind of zero in it's a little bit closer on the color for our background. So we've got a gray, but you know, if I just paint this gray, I know, let's do this right here, up there. Ooh, that's probably not what we want, right? It's a little bit heavy there. I'm gonna just wipe a bit of that off. You can see even as I wipe, some of that yellow comes right off. So you just have to be careful how much you wipe off, but I'm not concerned about that because she wouldn't have been concerned with that. She would have been happy having those different colors. So let's modify our gray. So maybe even before we do this, I'm just going to scoop a bit more of this, my black in here. Let's put a bit more white in there to make a gray. So that's a little bit lighter. That's great. I like that. And now what I'm going to do is, and you know what? I'm also just going to take a bit of this, and I'm just going to put a bit of my gray off to the side. Just in, sorry, I just put a little bit off to the side there as well. Maybe I want some gray at some point. I don't know, but since I've mixed it, who knows what I'm going to do here. So I'm just giving myself some options. Now I'm going to take a little bit of blue. Just add a bit of blue into this gray. I might just take a little bit of white, or yellow, sorry, and put a bit of yellow in there. Let's get a bit more blue. You know, I could have just done the same thing, instead of just added more blue into my black, and had it maybe a really dark blue, added white to it, so you, you might say, you're sort of making... An, unnecessary next step, but I think this will make kind of sense as we go. Um, the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to add a little bit. We could just paint this directly on here. If, if you don't have this material, which is called matte medium, that's okay. You could paint that directly on there. You could, if you had no other options, add water, or you could do what's called the dry brush is to just, you know, paint as you know, take as much of this paint off of your brush and try to paint kind of thinly on there. The thing is, is that it's going to, and you could also wipe a little bit off like I'm doing there. That also works. Um, but what I'm going to do is add a little bit of matte medium in here. And matte medium is basically paint without pigment. It's transparent. It's, it's uh, used for this exact type of purpose. So now I can stir this up. It's not going to change the color in any way. The color is going to stay exactly the same. It's just making this color transparent or a little bit transparent. Right? Obviously, the more we put in there, the more transparent it becomes. So now I'm going to take this. Let's bring these two side by side. And I'm going to paint on my background here. And you know what? I kind of almost feel, now that I get that in there, I want a little bit more white. And I'm going to mix this in there a little bit. Let's see. Yeah, I'm going to need a little bit more matte medium. really liking the way that that wipe effect is happening and that's actually artists who paint with oil paint are very familiar with wiping paint away like this so I'm just gonna play with this technique a little bit here uh, so I mentioned the dry brush what you can do just get as much of this paint off of your brush as possible and then paint like this kind of like scrubbing the surface of the canvas
Let me see, how are we doing? I think it's looking pretty good. I'm gonna go into this vase as well. I'm just kind of spreading that paint around. Now maybe I said, like, ah, I want to kind of lighten that area up. Ah, some of that white coming through. That's okay. Uh, you know, I'm just going to let this dry for just a few moments. I'm going to come back and maybe uh, tinker with that again in a moment. But I want to do the same thing to this one. And again, I think I'm going to need a bit more that medium and sometimes it's easier just to like literally take this put it off to the side so I'm I'm just mixing color into my medium just to make it more and more transparent okay let's do the same thing here So obviously you can already see the difference between that input amateur being a little bit rustier of a color versus it being a little bit lighter. Um, now we can still, I can still mix enough the paint in a way that it will get very close to the original because in, let's say, just uh, zoom up here. You know, in a few places, this is getting close to that color. But let's see if we can still get them even closer. So this has got a bit more of a reddish kind of quality. So I think what I want to do is I'm going to add a bit more yellow into this mixture. interacting with the color that was there before and even kind of as I paint with it I'm kind of wiping some paint away from the previous layers but I don't mind that right so again I'm, I want to I want to be able to see through that paint very quickly scrubbing into this surface as the paint dries too what ends up happening and this is usually not something you want to do but you know impressionism is again playing with you know the quote unquote rules is you know if i take my brush and i just sort of wipe off paint it's like using a rag but instead of getting the 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 look of a rag it's like a paintbrush look so we can use this to kind of wipe off some paint if you want if you feel like it's a little bit too thick again you might notice i'm actually wiping all the way down to the white of the canvas so if that's a if, if you're like oh no oh what have i done that's okay that's okay so even though it's not exactly the same that's okay i'm going to save this step and I'm going to move on to the next part here because we're going to come back to our background as we paint here. So let's uh, let's do the brown of the table next. So let's just set this fella to the side here and take a sip of tea.
Kathy says, mine always goes browner. And I'm using Amsterdam paint when I'm mixing my blacks. Interesting. So try adding just a little bit more blue into your into your brown. So it should get you closer to your uh, to to black. So uh, let's do our our brown. We did mix a cup of brown here, and I could use this color. I'm sure I have enough of it to do that. But let's just do it again in case somebody's just joining us. So to mix the brown that we see on the bottom here, we want a warm brown because warm comes towards us and it's in the foreground, right? So remember, warm colors appear to converge or, or advance towards the viewer versus cool colors recede or appear to go backwards into space, right? So we always want, generally you want cool colors in the, the sky as it went far off into the horizon. <laughs> or you want uh, um, water to be warmer as it's closer to you, right? If you're painting a sky above water, for instance. There are times when we kind of invert that, and we've done a few episodes where we where I deliberately try to pick paintings that kind of are the exception to the rule, just to show you how, even though it's kind of the exception to the rule, we still use the rule in there in different places. Anyway, let's uh, mix our, our brown that's in the bottom here. So we're gonna take our warm yellow and our warm red, a little bit less of the red because red is, is really dominant, right? So we're gonna mix that together. And you notice like I've got a little bit of yellow here and a little bit more red here. So if I need a little bit more yellow, I go this way. Need a little bit more red, I go this way. So let's just see, let's, a good orange. Now let's take our warm blue and bring it over here. And let's kind of just like I, now I've got all three, I can mix as needed. So let's look at the painting kind of closely. We want uh, a, a brown that is kind of, it's going to alternate. We're gonna, I think we're going to have a bit of a darker uh, bluish brown in places, like we have up here. And then we're going to want a, a warmer reddish brown down here. <laughs> or, I mean, they're all warm, but... Uh, so I'm just going to add a little bit more red into that color. Get a little bit more blue in there. Maybe a bit more blue. That's pretty good. And we'll see. Maybe maybe it's going to end up looking a little bit too orangey. And then we can just add more blue later. Alright, so I'm going to quickly put this in. I'm still using, like, I'm using a big brush here. Still haven't transitioned to a smaller brush. And I won't really do that until I'm quite close to the end. All right. So that looks great, It's but it's a little bit solid. So I'm just going to wipe that excess paint off, and we're just going to kind of go back over here and just wipe some of this paint off the canvas. You could do this... Um, with a dry brush to start, but it's hard to really paint in and around these details with a dry brush. So I'd rather put the paint on and then wipe off the excess. All right, so now this brush, you know, it's, there's, it's mostly dry, barely any paints coming off the brush because as I'm going over the surface, I'm wiping paint off my canvas. All right, again, so now all of that paint is going on my rag. Um, let's do the same thing here on this one, even though I think we probably need a, we don't need quite as much. And this is part of our underpainting or our imprimatur, depending on how you approach that. But I'm going to take some of this paint, a little bit of the um, 
brighter, more orangey brown. Grab a quick bit of that. Up here. Maybe just bring a bit of it back into here while I'm zipping around. And again, I can if I went too far, it can wipe off a bit. Um, but you know what? Actually, I think I'm going to put a bit more of that back there. I kind of liked it a little bit. A little more red down there. Okay. I think that's good for that step. So let's just, again, just take a look at these paintings side by side, so you can just see how they're coming along. You know, obviously, there it's almost indistinguishable. As we go forward, it becomes a, more and more indistinguishable. You know, obviously, you could see a difference now, but I think, you know, by the time we get towards the end of this painting, I then we might have, especially if somebody tuned in at the beginning and then tuned at the end, um, they might have a hard time figuring out which one is which. Which is, you know, as far as I'm concerned, kind of ideal because of using this the system that I've been using for a while, right? Um, you know what? Actually, maybe just before I do move on, I am going to just use a little bit of a darker... Uh, brown here. So I'm going to take a little bit of my warm blue, warm red, and mix this up. So it goes a little bit purpley, so I'll just take a little bit more yellow and put that in there. Now I've got a, a kind of a much darker, almost purpley brown. I'm just going to take a little bit of paint off there. And let's bring the original back up. I just want to do this so I'll just have less to do later. I'll kind of just go into some of these areas. All right, because again, I, I want to have lots of variety of colors, including my browns. So it's not just one kind of brown there, but we've got a few different ones. Let's look at this fellow again, see if there's anything we can do. It's already pretty dark up there. Probably could just skip this. Oh, a little bit of yellow came onto my brush there. That's okay. Okay. I think we'll get most of the other browns up there later on, even though she probably did that all at the same time, but she's one of the greatest artists of all time, a, a certified master, so she's capable of, of doing magical things that uh, most of the rest of us uh, find a little bit more difficult. <laughs> so, um, now, let's move on to the foreground. So already we've got two paintings, both of which have, you know, a background, I wouldn't say it's finished, but well established, that we can then go in and modify and give a little bit more nuance. But before we do that, um, because I, again, I'm, I always stress, that's why I like to do these passes. Go to the background, do a pass, go to the foreground, do a pass, go back to the background, do another pass, back to the foreground, and maybe even back to the background, right? Rather than, than trying to, like, I got to get that background perfect before I move on. Why? Who, who says that? And I think some people are like, that's going to be faster. If I get that perfect, to me, that sounds like someone who says, who wants is making a thanksgiving dinner which is thanks canadian thanksgiving on monday uh speaking of which it sounds like someone who's like well i'm gonna cook each plate separately so i'm gonna make mashed potatoes i'm not gonna even start the oven for my turkey i'm gonna 
Get the mashed potatoes, perfect. Okay, that's perfect. Mmm, tastes great. Put that aside. Let's now go to the turkey, and I'm going to cook the entire turkey perfectly. It's ready to serve, but I'm not done because i got ten other dishes to do. And then you get all ten dishes, and then you serve them, and people are like, well, the turkey has been sitting on the counter for four hours getting cold. The mashed potatoes are, are like, inedible because they're freezing. But, hey, the peas taste great because they just came out of the oven. All right? So, anyway, I digress. I always digress, right? <laughs> um... So our our what we want to do now is paint the the like the the flower petals. Let's go to this. So well maybe before we even do that, let's get the green in. Let's paint the leaves and maybe even maybe we do want to paint some of the the, the brown on the stems and stuff right now. So you know, here, I, I just said we'll save that for later, but now that I'm looking at it, I think maybe maybe it is the time to do that. So, let's put these side by side. Um, we're going to mix that same brown again. So we're going to take our warm yellow and warm red. Let's mix that together. That's a pretty reddish green or reddish brown, and let's take our warm blue, and mix this into here. This is gonna give us a, a bit of a darker brown. It's always interesting because, you know, something like that kind of looks quite purpley because it's next to this red and this yellow and the orange. When in fact, yeah, maybe it looks a little bit purpley here when it's next to these colors, but when it's next to a green and a, um, another blue, it's going to look very brown, right? So the color is always quite relative, right? So let's, I'm still staying with a bit of a larger brush. I don't want to kind of get too far into the details yet. And... Let's, um, so I want some of this brown to kind of come through underneath the green that I'm about to paint here in a moment. Where else? Now he's painting, or sorry, Berta Morisot, she <laughs> is painting with oil paints. So one of the, the things with oil paints is it's going to stay wet for much longer. And that's how you can get those colors kind of nicely blend. When we're painting with acrylic, that's much more difficult to do. Yes, we could use a slow dry medium, of which here is the actual thing. Um, I'm not going to put that in this painting because probably most people don't have that material and I really don't think it's necessary. I mean, maybe I'll do a future impressionist painting where we do use a little bit of it to try to keep the painting open is what we would say, like, so that it's still a little bit wet. Um, but I just don't think I need it just yet. Let's go in there. While I've got a little bit of this darker color, I'm just going to paint a little bit back on this table here. <laughs> okay, let's go to this one right into our browns. There's Believe Jesus is Lord says I'm late. Sorry. Hi, Mike. <laughs> There's, oh, Kathy and John and um, two Johns, different Johns. we got the white wasabi says, hello, I just started. Awesome. Good to have you all watching. So let's just 
do this one. I'm not even going to look. You know, I've got my original, um, or the other one right next to it, side by side here. I'm just going to, almost, I'm just going to, rather than trying to replicate this painting, I'm just going to go back to the original, which means that as these paintings develop, they might diverge a little bit. Plus, I'm just going to paint right through that leaf. And you can see, again, I'm holding the brush. This is a, a larger brush, and I'm holding it kind of far away. I'm not painting like a pencil, or as if I have a pencil. I'm painting with a brush, and I'm holding it quite far away, which, is, which does create maybe a little bit of... It can make people feel a little bit uncomfortable because it might lead to a little bit looser painting, a little bit sloppier. It might feel that way, for sure. But it's also, this is the way the Impressionist painted. Because when you do this, you obviously you're going to lose a little bit of, of precision. But I, I don't mean to be a broken record, but the Impressionists aren't concerned about precision, right? That's not, um, they, they're going for feelings, and they're trying to evoke mood, right? So it does, it's not important that, it, that we're, we're precise with the brush strokes. I sometimes always think, like, what if the ghost of, uh, of uh, Berta Moriso is here. Would she be like, no, that's I, no, I actually am concerned about uh, precision. And I, I think there. I mean, I'm, I don't mean to say that she was sloppy or the impressionists were sloppy and didn't care about doing a good job or being good craftspersons. I just mean that, unlike, like Leonardo da Vinci and that very academic approach to painting. It's more about this spontaneity and like the urgency of painting. And when you're painting that way, precision might be still important, but it ha it has necessarily takes a back seat. You know, it's it's almost like impressionist painters. You know, if they were alive today, I, they would be people who would be on like reality. There would be a reality TV show of like painting in the impressionist manner as in 20 minutes it'd be like Berta Morisot or Claude Monet would be like the Bob Ross of today like 30 minutes crank out a painting like this so I like my stems I can always paint more or less and I might alter them a little bit with my background past two which will come to shortly but let's do our leaves next so the question might be now which green do I want to paint with? Do I want a cool green by mixing cool blue and cool yellow or a warm green by mixing warm yellow and, and warm blue? So let's just do a little bit of test because I think he's using a bit of both. So let's take our cool blue and our cool yellow and mix this together. And we get a kind of green here. This is a very a saturated emerald green. It's a beautiful green that the Impressionists did use. Um, but before I, uh, well, let me just, instead of cleaning that brush, let's just get a different brush. Um, it is a bit of an unnatural color, which, you know, the Impressionists did like kind of pushing those limits. So let's now just take here our warm yellow and our warm blue and we can see that these are, you know, two different greens. One is really bright. You know, it's it's almost like candy. And this one has got more of like, you know, a, a grassy color, maybe even like fall grass color. And in between these is maybe the color we see in the painting or the green that you might see every day. But you probably very rarely ever see a green like that in nature, unless maybe light is hitting it in a particular way. So, 
what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to I'm going to use some of my cool green that I've just mixed here, and I'm going to put that in the painting, and then I might paint over large most of it uh, with some warmer colors because this is going to kind of make that color recede. The one thing is, is just like uh, I mentioned right off earlier. I don't know if it was off the top, as I was about to say. But Berta Mauricio often painted with a lot of white. Uh, not a lot in this painting. But let's put a bit of white into our uh, cool green we just mixed here. Um, in fact, I might just add a bit more yellow in there. And I, again, almost every, really every time you're painting as an impressionist or if you're trying to get into that headspace you're almost mixing paint Did I, what just oh the microphone just fell okay uh, you're almost mixing a different um color every time you dip your paintbrush back into the paint okay so let's go back to this fella Um, let's see, sorry, what Paula says. Uh, White Wasabi says, I just watched your business course. Which was my business course? <laughs> Did I do a business course? Um, uh, episode one. Which one was that? Maybe my... The, the introductory painting episode, I guess. Did I talk a little bit about business in there? Um, Paula says, hi, Michael, can you tell us A or B you are doing? I'm confused which flower. Thanks. Um, okay, so, um, this one I guess you, we could call A. This is the one with the yellow you can still see in here. And this is B. This is the one that I'm painting maybe a little bit closer to the way that she would have painted it. I'll try to, to point that out a little bit more. As we go, okay. So let's get some of this paint on here. And I'll be painting on my A painting here. And again, you can see this is a short brush. It actually was a longer, but it broke. Um, so again, I'm holding it further away, and it's almost like I'm just letting it kind of, just lazily kind of touch the surface of the canvas. I'm not really, you know, trying to aggressively push paint in here. Right, and is it the exact color on there? I don't know. Not really. If it's if your paint's still a little bit wet on the surface here, that's great too. going to paint right into the water area. This is the water in the cup, right? <laughs> and I think I'm just going to take a little rag again and just take this rag and maybe just remove some of this paint. You know, you can always just go in and just drag off some of the excess when you're painting in this particular style, obviously, right? Uh, there's a little bit of green down here so just push that in and you know, just rub it away with my finger <laughs> okay I'm gonna just jump over to painting B as uh, Paula mentioned here so I'm just gonna quickly do the same thing on this one
Now, if I was painting with with oil paint, this would be great because I could put just a little bit of this paint on here, and um, uh, let the let it mix into the future layers. That kind of could make things a little bit easier. Um, so I'll leave that. Let's go back to A. Now what I'm, let's see, let's take the same color. I'm just going to modify it a little bit, just to put a bit more blue into my green. Or a bit more cool blue into that green. Maybe let's just, not everywhere. Little dashes here and there. Few little dashes, right? Let's do that on this one here too. And you know, this is gonna mean that because I'm moving so quickly, it's it's gonna mean my painting might look a little bit different than the original, or it will. It just it, it because I'm giving more and more of my attention to the painting itself. Back to painting A. Uh, I was gonna wipe my brush off, but instead of wiping it off, I'm gonna now just sort of take this other green with, with my paintbrush still with the paint that's on it. In fact, I might even just go back, you know, take some of this paint, bring it into this paint, so that we're we've, we're kind of now mixing these two different greens together. This one's a lot more of a muted grassy green. It's my warmer green. And I don't want to cover everything because I like some of those colors that are there. I'm just kind of adding a little nuance to what what I have. Warmer green with warm yellow and warm blue. And as you know, my there's it's pretty dry. There's not a lot of paint on my brush as I'm painting over top of things here. And I might come back and add more to that as we go. But I think for our purpose right now, I think that's pretty good. I'm happy with that. So let's just clean the brush. <laughs> oh, uh, White Wasabi says my beginner's well, my beginner's painting course. Okay, a business course. I was like, that sounds like a good idea. Uh, yeah, my, my beginner's painting course that I did. It's sad that there's only 15 people watching. Ah, 17 pe people come and go. You know, these are longer episodes. I don't expect people to sit and watch the whole thing. And um, The channel keeps on growing as it, at its own pace. When I started on YouTube a decade ago, I was really obsessed about getting viewers and all that kind of stuff. And I think I'm just at a 10 years later, different point in my life that it's like if people want to watch, great. People don't want to watch, great. I know there's a lot of people, the, the vast majority of people that watch these episodes watch them long after they aired. And sometimes people like just to skip ahead to what they want to do and turn the volume off, 
and just paint along with me or whatever people want to do. It's all, it's all fine with me, right? So, uh, but I appreciate uh, the mention there. Uh, I, I do appreciate that. So, our next step here. Let's go back. Oh, no, we don't want to go to the background. In fact, pretend like you didn't see this because I want to do the flowers first. I'm, I'm just getting so excited. Uh, I want to. Uh, so yeah, never mind. We're we're still we're still gonna stick around here for a little bit longer. <laughs> um, so let's now mix some uh, pinks and reds and even a little bit of orange here. So just like we did with our greens, I think we're going to be using a just two different uh, pinks. So let's just see how this works. Uh, let's put both of them on. So let's just take a warm red and take a little bit of white. I think I did this the other day, but you know, not everybody watches every episode, right? So that's my warm red with white. Let's take our cool red and also add white. So I'm not sure how well that comes across on camera. This here with my cool red, that has a real, like, I think when people think of pink, that's the color they're probably thinking of. It's like a hot pink, right? Um, whereas this has a bit more, my warm red with white has a bit more of a pastel, uh, red quality. I mean, I guess it looks kind of pink. Uh, it's like a softer pink, not as loud as this. And it's not, no, this is a magenta, right? This is magenta and this is a cadmium red, two very different pigments. This is much colder than this because this red has some yellow orange pigments already in it that I'm bringing out with the white or yellow versus my cool red has some bluish pigments in it, which is why it goes cooler and mixes a really nice purple very easily. So we have two of these. Let's just sort of take a look. Let's zoom into the painting and let's hold this canvas next to here just so you can see. So there's, you know, some of these areas here are a bit cooler and muted versus some of these other areas are a bit warmer and more saturated. So, and let's say for instance, up in this flower, we've definitely got just some red right on its own and even maybe a bit of orange in this red. I mean, you can just see that this, the way the brushes are moving quickly over that surface. It's so exciting, right? So uh, let's jump back a bit. And uh, I think I'm going to start. Um, well, you know, I should say that we can mix. We, we could do everything with a warm red um, and just add a little bit of warm blue in here. But I think just for fun, I'm going to take a bit of this cooler uh, red or pink now and paint a little bit with that just so we can probably we'll see it kind of maybe more clearly when we actually have them on the canvas together so i'm going to paint into some of those areas you can almost see it's got a bit of a purpley quality It's just sort of little brush strokes here and there. Dab, 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 dab. Uh, that might be good enough. Maybe let's take a little bit more white. And dab, 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 dab. All right these little brush strokes that's the key to all impressionism right 
So we've got all these cooler pinks on there. Let's do the same thing with this painting, and I'm just gonna start, uh, just gonna wipe some of that off. Let's go back to a little bit of a darker, cool um, pink. And let's just put this back in. This is painting B, Paula. Let's get some more of the white into my cool red there. Again, you can see that, like, I like just to jump around. while I've got this slightly pinkish color, just put a bit of it onto my cup. Just there's a bit of that pink in here. I don't know if she really quite did that, but it won't hurt for, it to, for there to be a bit of that slightly pink white in here. I'm just gonna do a bit of that. things up okay so now uh, let's put a bit of warm red in here so let's take some warm red in fact I'm just gonna take this warm red I didn't really I didn't wash the brush I just wiped off my excess paint I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna paint this right in here This one too, as well. Okay. There we go. So clean these brushes, both of them, because the next step is I'm going to go back to my background and tidy the, that up. So maybe actually just before I do that, let's just take a moment just to look at these again side by side. Um, because probably over the next, as a, the next little bit here, these are going to get much closer together. Right now, they, they still look like the backgrounds are very different. I think when we get the next little bit of paint on, those backgrounds might start to look a little bit closer together. All right. So, uh, our next step here. Come on. So our next step is our, our background pass number two. We're going to go back and maybe modify it, clean it up, add a little bit more detail perhaps. So let's start with uh, our version A, I suppose you could say, right? In fact, just to help you, um, let's... this 
one on the top and bottom. I was gonna do, which one do I wanna do? Let's do a little tab like that. So here, this is for you, Paula. Great idea anyway, right? So A and B. A and A. <laughs> that way we can tell these apart. And I can tell them apart, because maybe I'll get confused too. So, um, yeah, did I, did I just show those? Let's just go right to this. Okay, so our background pass, I wanted to go in and kind of just uh, clean up background. And that might also involve cleaning up a little bit of the edges of some of the plants, right? Uh, or the vase. And even adding a little bit of more color into the vase that isn't there yet. Okay. And I think we, we could still use the color that we have we used earlier on in this painting. So I'm going to take a brush. Let's look at our colors side by side. And just think what we need. How, what do we need to get this painting closer to the one on the left? Well, maybe there's just a lot of this warm yellow coming through, and I think we can just sort of mute that down a little bit. All right, so I think we can go for just a little bit more of a bit of a blue-gray for this particular painting. But I think we'll probably again put a bit of matte medium in here. And I'm not really gonna bother stirring this in too well because remember, I want that variety to, to happen. I'm gonna squeeze off some of that excess paint. So let's attack this canvas here. that too much it's a little much let's just wipe some of it off on there and just sort of scrub it in. Don't worry about going back over top of some of your flowers and leaves and stuff. That's okay. This is again why you don't want to just get it all perfect the first time around because what if you got it all perfect and then you're painting over it and obscuring parts wouldn't that be such a drag That's pretty close. I think I'm going to just take a bit more blue. Just dab that blue right on my brush just to get a bit in that color. And let's just 
Whoa, that's pretty. That's very blue. Just let that dry a little bit. Bring it in here. Kind of went a bit overboard with that, but that's okay. I certainly don't mind. Let's see. I think that's okay. It does, does feel very... Uh, I think this needs to get darker too, so we'll tackle that in a moment. Let's go back to this fellow though. So this one is sort of going in the opposite direction because we've got this reddish color underneath. Uh, we want to kind of, if I put more blue in here, it's just going to really darken that. So I want to put the opposite. I'm going to put some of this yellow into this mixture. And let's paint this right so this is going to just give that background a bit more of a greenish quality area here. I was a little bit heavy-handed just as I was on the other painting. That's okay. So you can see like the speed of which I'm just sort of smudging things in there. So that's almost that's pretty darn close to the original. I didn't it didn't seem that way. Remember how this one uh, at one point seemed like it was much closer, but now it's feels like it's further away. So maybe let's what do we what do we need to do to get this back? I think maybe just a little bit more gray. Yeah, that blue is a little intense. Maybe I'm, let's see if we put a bit more of this greenish color in here. Like, this is going on very thin. Like, there's very little paint coming off of my brush here. I mean, I could even do a little bit more. Let's take a, just, just take a bit more yellow. Why not, right? Again, I'm also using cool yellow for this. Not only just because it's the, the color that that is there, but it's also, if we put too much... Um, warm colors into that background it's going to compete with the flowers in the foreground right we don't want that we want this to recede backwards mm. let's 
So you can see I kind of scrubbed a little bit of paint off here. Let's just... I'll have to probably let that dry. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep rubbing paint off here. But... Okay. Um, maybe while I'm here, let's do the table as well. So that's, you know, I kind of, I might have just gone a little bit overboard with that cool color in terms of matching the original. I'm not going to spend any more time on it. Otherwise, we'll just be here all night. But I think that's, I'm happy enough with that. I'm going to take, mix my um, brown for the foreground again. I'm going to make this one darker. So I'm taking my... Um, warm red and warm blue and mixing that in to make a nice dark color there's also again not a lot of paint that i'm using here so i'm going to have a little bit more of a, a brushy to this other side I'm just going to kind of leave it a little bit lighter it's not quite the exactly like the original but I just like that burning corner warm red right there you know if I go back to B here this is already pretty dark, so I don't think I need to do too much. I might just clean up my line here. I guess it's kind of like a horizon line in of the table. And just kind of sort that a bit. John is saying good night. Good night, John. Well, my table's a little bit. Is that a little bit sloped? Sometimes that drives me crazy. before I'm pretty satisfied with these backgrounds. I'm just going to show you how these paintings look like side by side here. Oops, let's put them in the right order here. All right, so I did, there's a little bit more yellow in there. Who's to say which one's better? I don't know. Does it really matter? They'll be a little bit... I think it's nice for them to have a bit of their own personalities here, so... Uh, but we can all... Again, we could... I could work on that for hours and hours and hours if I want. But I do instead want to move on to... Another step here. 
So now I want to move on to uh, the foreground. And ideally now we're starting to get pretty close to finishing. It might not feel that way right now, but really this is where things are going to come together pretty quickly. We're going to use a smaller brush, finally. Up until now we've used larger brushes. And this is, I, I can't tell you, like, whenever I'm teaching painting classes, within like five minutes people are right into the tiny brush and I'm like, if you keep on using that tiny brush, I'm going to take it away. Keep on using your big brush. Get to this. You know, we've been painting, what, for an hour and a half. And we've used almost exclusively larger brushes. Like my smallest brush here, about the half the size of my pinky nail. Or almost the, uh, but three quarters the size of my pinky nail here, right? Um, so, and then we've used this one and this one. Now we're, we're going to start going to, you know, some of our smaller brushes to get into some finer details. But it's not until we get to this point where we want to do that. Okay. So let's start with A. And what should we do first here? Let's just look at the original briefly. Um, I think I'm going to just clean up my, my green, my, my brown, I'm doing my browns, my greens, the flowers, maybe it'll be browns, greens, vase, flowers, done. Okay. Browns, greens, vase, and flowers, done. Browns, green, flowers, done. Browns, green, flowers, browns, green, browns, greens, vase, flowers, done. Browns, green, flowers, vase, done. This, anyway, too much for my little brain. And we're, oh, there's my little brush. So let's do mix our brown again. Our darker brown. So one of the things, using my smaller brush to mix colors, I probably am not going to get as an even of a mixture, which I like, right? I like that the color is going to be a little bit different with each brush stroke, and that's a big part of painting in this kind of approach. So let's maybe start zooming in here. Yeah, you can really see the difference in the background color, but it is what it is. It's okay. of brown here and there. Bring that back. Let's go over here. That's the edge of the painting. feels like a little bit sloppy the way that I'm painting. Kind of just scrubbing paint in. So 
So that's just my brown. I just added more warm blue into that mixture. This looks like there's another stem here. Getting a bit of a lighter green or brown on on here for the stem. Ooh, I like how he did a little squiggle there. I like that. Or she did. Why? It just shows my own inherent bias there. To refer to her instinctively as a man. Old habits are hard for us to break, aren't they? Okay, I think that's good for this paint, painting A with my brown. So let's just go back the other way. Let's just redo this real quick. I'm going to take some of my warm blue. Ah, do I need... Need a bit more warm red here. Oh, that's more than I needed. But... All right, kind of just a messy brown. I love it. Again, you can see how I'm holding this brush kind of farther away, and I'm just sort of letting it drag over the surface. That's going to mean it's maybe not fully consistent either way. It's okay, though. So remember I painted over some of these greens and everything, right? So as I kind of go back over, I'm kind of bringing back some of that um, Just before I move on, I'm just going to take a little bit of a lighter brown. There's a few little places where I wanted that. Let me just think about in here.
I'm still on B, Paula. <laughs> um, anything else? Let's come back to A here and just add this little bit lighter um, brown in. bit of brown down in that vase, I suppose. <laughs> okay, let's just, I'll just show you these at full scale. So there's B and A. And let's just put them side by side very quickly. And I might have gone a little bit heavy with that that second brown. It's okay though. I mean, I think it's it's helping the painting, but it's maybe diverging slightly from the original. But okay. So which let's do the flower next. So let's start with A. It's, we're gonna, we're getting very close to wrapping both of these paintings up. So, actually, let's put the... Oops. Um, in fact, let's zoom back in. And let's tackle each little area of the painting. Yeah. So this time, I'm going to use... Probably the majority is going to be warmer red. We used a little bit of cooler red and white. Now I'm mostly going to be leaning on my um, my warmer colors. I'm going to take a bit of uh, yellow. I'm actually going to mix that here. I want just a bit of slightly peachy color for this top flower. Oh, I forgot the greens. Okay, we'll come back and do the greens there, yeah. The reason I just added a bit of this little bit of yellow and peachiness. It's just, a, again, the variety of colors in 
in a painting is very important. So, uh, all right, let's go up to the top one first before I get too far. Now is this color a little bit yellow in there? Not really. I'm putting it in there just because as I'm working on mine, I feel like I kind of just want that in there just for balance, but. And probably because, you know, I'm gonna paint over things as well as I go forward here. It's nice just to have sometimes these little colors poking through. So I can always use a white on top, well, I will use white on top of a bunch of that. Um, I'm even going to take, well, I was going to maybe put a bit on the vase of this color. Maybe just a tiny bit of this bit more peachy color down in here. Because all of this glass is, is reflecting light. Um, and that light is in these flowers, right? So that's painting A. Let's go back to painting B here with this. Again, I'm going to need to mix just a little bit more. So some white. Uh, some warm yellow. A little bit of warm red. Of these curving brush strokes as I go around. I think of a peony as like a it's like a whirlpool. Like a lot of flowers kind of have this kind of circular uh can what is that uh, spiral kind of quality. So I'm kind of building these kind of concentric kind of spaces of which it's not facing directly. It's sort of like the front of it is kind of right in there, right? Uh, oh, and uh, I'm just going to go up to the top, finish that off, and then we're going to use a bit of a different color. Okay, um, let's mix, what should we do now? Let's, let's take this same, let's go the opposite direction. I'm going to take 
some white, and some warm red. And this time I'm going to take some of my warm blue. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> my apologies. Right in your in your headphones there. Oof, brutal. And I'm mixing that and I'm getting a slight kind of purple, which is, you know, a little bit like my... Remember I said this magenta is a bit of a purple quality? This is the same thing, but it's got a bit more, more of a dead quality. Slightly... I'm taking, by adding a color that's on the opposite side of the color wheel, I'm kind of taking some of the energy out of it. Excuse me. I'm going to darken that down here later. And now I'm kind of building up some little bit larger brush strokes. I'm allowing the paint to kind of mix on my brush as I dip it back into the paint. It does sort of look like this is kind of smudged in here, doesn't it? So maybe let's just smudge it a bit. Right, if that's how you, you look at it, you're like, it kind of looks like it's smudged. Smudge it! Do it. Uh, let's go back to painting A and do the same thing with our darker, slightly purpley color. There's some of that blue that came off, but I don't mind that. color there. It's just warm um, warm red and warm blue and white. It's a little bit darker than I expected. It's okay. Remember, we should want it kind of some variety, so Take a bit, just some red, mix it a bit into that color just to make it a bit more 
reddish. Feel free to get your fingers in there and smudge it and make it kind of messy. And <laughs> that's okay. Um, let's see. Pretty close up to there. Let's go back to B. <laughs> John says, too realistic. Love it. Let's go, I'm just going to take some white. Not totally white, it's still got a little bit of other color in there, but I'll put this in here, and again, let's get my finger in there and smudge it around. take well, that's a little heavy handed but that's okay let's see do I need any more any white up here Good. Let's go back to A.
Okay. Now let's we're gonna do just a few more things on these paintings. We're getting very close to, to wrapping up. So let's put some of the leaves back on and the reflections on the vase and we'll be done. So So our next step is just some finishing touches, finishing some leaves, some of the stuff on the vase. Is there any stuff in the background we might want to touch up a little bit? Feeling pretty close to being done. And you know, we're, we're almost at two hours of actually painting. I, I spoke for about 45 minutes, longer than I wanted, but anyway, we're getting, getting there, right? Um, so... <clears throat> Let's really what I'm going to be doing is painting with my warm um, greens. So taking my warm yellow and my warm blue, and that's the same color it was there. If I want to add a little bit more spiciness to it, I could mix. I have some of my warm yellow, or cool yellow and cool blue up there. So let's just, we've got a bit of that. I'm just going to bring that down there. So I got these two greens and I can kind of just bounce back and forth and mix a little bit together. And oops, oops, there we go. Okay. So let's just kind of, I'm starting with painting A here. It is a little, it's getting close to my background color, which is a bit concerning to me. So when I do my next color, my next green, I'm gonna make sure to make it darker, just to help create some separation there. This is B. And it's interesting because, you know, both of these paintings have sort of taken on lives of their own and flipped flopped back and forth be between being like my favorite which is what's so interesting about working on any painting is that, and one of the reasons why I, I, when I'm making my own artwork, I usually paint just like this. I usually have two canvases going simultaneously so that um, I have, it gives me the freedom to experiment and try different things on different canvases. And I'm just kind of like scratching the surface with my paintbrush. 
blending it in. And let's just go for just a little bit of a darker warm brown. My warm yellow, warm blue. And I'm just gonna put this see that <clears throat> this is my my green I just there's a lot of of my warm blue in there and if you look at the palette it's like whoa that's too much too much uh, blue in there it just looks like a blue yeah but in comparison to the what's on the canvas it looks fine right it doesn't look too blue at all Painting B. So let's go to painting A. Let's finish this off. Last little thing with the flowers that I want to tackle. I just want to get a bit more of this gray on that particular leaf there. So let's take some of my gray from before. To put a bit of warm blue in there. Maybe a bit of cool red. That gives it a bit of a purpley gray. Is that too intense? If it's a little intense, let's just take a bit more gray and that's just going to mute it down a bit but uh, I want to put this in there maybe is there anywhere else on these flowers that wants a bit of Painting B. Oh, 
Okay, so I think the last little bit that I want to do, and I, I could fiddle with everything, but I just want to go to the glass now. So I'm going to finish our painting off in this area here. So we can see that that glass has a bit of this cool blue into it and gray. So we take some white, mix it into this blue. Just take some gray that I've got around here. I'm gonna paint with this in a few places anyway. You don't want to go too overboard with this because the, the genius of what she's done is the subtlety of this cup or vase. Just a few little lines communicate what it is. It's kind of a little bit bright, so I'm just going to go for a little bit of a darker gray. color. go for I'm gonna, actually I'm gonna <clears throat> just wipe that off I want a gray that's maybe a bit more yellowy gray which is gonna make it go a little bit green a little bit greener again I'm taking my cool yellow and where do I want to put that maybe Back to painting B. You know, I mixed this is my painting B, and I had remember that bit of a pink color that I painted in some of there I didn't put this on the bottom in this one here and I like how that looks on my painting not quite in hers 
But I always say, like, your painting's got to live on its own. So, what do you need to bring it to life? Hmm, not happy with that last brush stroke, so I'm just gonna get a cloth, wipe that away. Yeah, I think I'm gonna go for a darker gray here. Let's get a bit more. Actually, I could get my blue, my black into my cool blue. She had a bit of more green right there. Um, I'm putting a little bit of a slightly different color there. Again, just because it feels like my version is are slightly different, so I have to make my versions work. Version A again. in there so hmm. you could see like her genius of being able to get this I mean that's on her painting it just, the background seamlessly goes through. I'm much more heavy-handed there. Trying to lighten that up, but... Ah, let's zoom out and just see how we feel here. Put little dabs of paint around here. She's got some white little reflections. Just pure white right out of the tube. Pretty close for my taste. 
let's just take a look at this one. Just a few little highlights on this vase. Okay, I think um, I think I could fiddle more in these flowers, but I also have to. Whoa! I got to take over for my wife here. Uh, oops! We want this here. Okay, so it's time to do a little side-by-side -side comparison and just sort of look at these two paintings, how they turned out, and if you can tell the difference between which one, all right? So maybe just we'll look at these two simultaneously together here. And do you remember which one was done in which way? If you recall, a, this is A, where's that flap, right? So this is the one I used. I put yellow imprimatura just across the entire surface. This one I used that slightly brown, or not slightly, it was, it was a brown, and then I kind of did a little bit of painting as underpainting on, on there. Which one is which? I mean, I guess you can see this does look a little bit more yellow, but I think that was because I painted some cool yellow over top. It actually looked a little bit more bluish at a certain point. Now this has a bit more of that yellow, like if I was to look at these, I probably would have expected that to be my warm yellow because I also painted yellow in there. Like this might have a little bit more of a saturated background. I think maybe partly to do with my warm yellow that I put there originally, this kind of amping those colors up, but pretty close. Um, that's why I say, like, at the end of the day, the difference between these is, is like, very, um, very slight. All right? So, maybe before I, I dive into a little bit more detail compared to the original, just want to uh, encourage people who've been watching to hit that like button, subscribe, hit the notification bell. Again, we're doing a free episode this Sunday where we're going to celebrate your work. So join the Facebook group, upload your picture to the Facebook group if you want to support the channel, as so many of you have done in the past. Um, this is how I survive. This is one of the ways that I pay the bills around here. So uh, keeping the lights on, getting new equipment, keeping the, the microphones in order. There's a, You can use the Super Chat function here in within YouTube or PayPal. You want to contact me with the Facebook group, etc. Do that. So, um, let's let's look at painting A first here. Let's just see how that looks. In fact, I'm just gonna let's hide those because it's a little distracting. That green. Um, yeah, the background being a little bit bright like that is maybe a little bit distracting to me. If I see it on, on its own, I, I'm totally fine with it. But when I see it compared to the original, it obviously is a little bit different. It has a quality of color that is a little bit unnatural. This is all also much brighter 
but I also don't mind it. It's again, you when you're making your painting, sometimes you have to kind of if if you're leaning towards one way, go with it. Um she was again way more subtle with this vase. Let's just zoom in. You know, I'm not super happy with the, you know, some of the, the way that I've articulated these flowers is a little bit sloppy and doesn't really kind of capture their full volume. Like this is uh, a flower that's, you know, um, closed. And here's another one that's closed and they kind of just look like blobs. So if I was gonna spend another 20, 30 minutes, that's something I would tackle. That's something I always ask my students at the Emily Carr, the university I teach at, is like, what would you do if you had more time? And yeah, if we had infinite amount of time, we could make paintings infinitely better. But not everybody's got infinite amount of time. Here we did two paintings in two hours, right? We're, we're, obviously, there's going to be a few things missing. I mean, this vase, that's the way that she's done that is just genius. Really, there's, we could go I could go here and actually it's, it's the way that she sort of blended and smoothed that is is fantastic but I just can't spend any more time than I have here anything else I want to let's maybe look directly at the flower in the center yeah I mean if anything like hers is messier and smudged it looks I can see it looks like a rag went across that surface whereas mine looks kind of cleaner and I have more defined brush strokes and yet it looks not as believable that's the magic of impressionism let's look at painting B now and we can start with the peony uh, same sort of thing I'm, I'm, this one Similarly, kind of almost again more defined. Some of these brush strokes are louder and more um, contrasting to what was there. You can see that my background on this second painting is much closer to hers, to the original. So, you know, that's something just to think about if you're if you really want. I mean, obviously, I'm, it's also because I used the method that is most closely associated with the way that she and the other impressionists painted, right? Using that that uh, brown to start. This also has got a much warmer brown. I could have put a little bit more warm blue in here and darken that down significantly, but it is what it is, right? Let's just zoom back out. Very interesting seeing them like that. Let's just swap painting A back in there. Hmm. Interesting. Maybe that table just needed to be darker. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, everyone, we'll see you on Sunday um, at I can't, probably be 1 or o'clock Pacific time, so maybe 4 o'clock Eastern. We'll, we'll see. I have to post, look at the schedule. Um, enjoy the rest of your evening or morning, wherever you are on our beautiful planet. I really appreciate you guys sticking around and watching the creation of this painting together. So we shall see you all very soon. Have a great night, everybody. We'll talk to you soon.